Uh, thank you all for coming uh, tonight. We have really exciting talks and I don't want to take any time. Um, so our first talk is from Anna Dad, who is the CEO of Digital Technologies and Diversity Lead. Um, uh, we'll, each speaker will have about 10 minutes or less. Um, and then we can have a few questions uh, after each talk and then we can have a nice conversation at the end. After the Okay, uh, uh, well thank you everyone and, uh, and thank you again Android for inviting me uh, to this event uh, and uh, I was quite surprised and because I knew uh, we had some other great speakers speaking I didn't want to touch on the same things as them because there's, 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 there's so much in this uh, sphere of diversity and inclusivity. So um, I will give you a, a sort of... Uh, a short um, crazy of how I see uh, the importance of small business in this area. So, for me, diversity and inclusion cannot be spoken about without talking about economic equality based on gender, community, orientation and disability. It is 42 years since the Equal Pay Act came into force and we do not have equal pay between genders and it's nearly 42 years since the Race Relations Act came into force and we do not have parity. Uh, we'll stop. I'm going to finish that sentence. A resident, a man or woman, living in Richmond, London, only has to travel 10 stops on the district line to Whitechapel, and his or her life expectancy drops by 10 years. The average person in Whitechapel is from the immigrant community. The average person from Richmond is not. And the disparity in earnings is even starker. In 2017, we look at the corporate heights, we see glacial change in terms of all areas of diverse representation. And yet, amongst entrepreneurs and small business owners, we see a breadth of diversity and a realisation of ambition. So why is this? A short time after my father passed away, I was going through our loft in our family home when I discovered another suitcase. So out of curiosity, I opened this suitcase and inside I found a mountain of letters addressed to my father. My father had been successful, he was a highly educated man, and this is how I'd seen him since I was a small child. I started to pull the letters out of the envelopes, and every one of them was a rejection letter from an employer. So many. My father, an accountant with a good degree from Calcutta University, had come here to study in the 1960s, bringing myself and my mother with him. Though he found work in the corporate world, he looked up and he saw no one liked. And so he decided the only way to succeed was starting his own business. And this is probably a very familiar story to you, a familiar story about immigrant narrative. <coughs> and that's why I think small businesses have been better in bringing about economic equality in the UK. They employ 16 million people and there are 43,000 small businesses in Leicester and Leicestershire. Small business owners are a diverse group, thanks to the flexibility and autonomy of being an entrepreneur. A talented person may feel discriminated against as an employee or as a job applicant, either because of disability, or background, race, or just the need for flexibility. As an entrepreneur, often your differences can become your strengths, or at least be catered for in how you run your business. Small, if small businesses are really able to contribute to the diversity of the local community, they also are credited for hiring a diverse workforce and supporting their communities. And they take on those who may be larger corporates. Really. The DNA of a small business is about dependability, and there's a far more personal relationship between the employer and the employee. If small businesses are really able to play a full role in bringing about greater inclusion, diversity and equality, they will need an enabling state. They do not have the resources for Apple or Google, so the architecture around them must encourage them to pursue this diversity narrative. So what SMEs need is support to be able to attract and retain the most talented of our diverse workforce through resources, guidance to support them, often offers of apprenticeships, flexible working to make adjustments for disability, religious and other cultural needs. Sure stuff, after school nurseries and much better provision for childcare 
helping returning mothers has got to be an imperative if we are to move forward. The benefits of proactive state action outweigh the costs by a magnitude for our, for our economic and social well-being. Presently, we have some of the highest childcare costs in the OECD, and there are great examples in the Nordic countries where the state system has childcare as a core of their equality strategy. It's not rocket science. We want to see more women set up businesses. Presently, women make up 22% of small business owners. But if we had better child-friendly policies and women started businesses at the same rate as men, according to the present research, we would add 600 billion pounds to the UK economy. So, there have been many reports that have come out recently. We've had Parker and McGregor, and they've shown the unsatisfactory pace of change and the institutional bias still prevalent at the top of UK business. So how can we, in this room, make a difference? How can we change the movement? All of you can look at your businesses, your organisations, and the places you work, and say, do we look like the community? Do we look like our customers? And if we don't, why not? Are we really mentoring and looking for the best people by building pipelines of new, young talent? If there are no women in senior roles, ask the question, why? Inertia and groupthink can be fatal for businesses, and a diverse business is more resilient and demonstrates by its diversity, by, by its diversity that it can adapt. Set achievable targets, not just as an organisation, but as a team within your organisation. Every organisation should have their own targets and a business case for improved quality. Every organisation should publish that and talk about it. Take action. Assess yourself. Recognise your own unconscious bias. It's probably the very first step. Make sure you're acting in accordance with your own personal diversity and inclusion aspirations. What can you do personally to move this dial forward? Pull people in, take a risk. We already take risks with every person we hire or promote. Widen your potential talent pool. Listen. Actively seek the opinion of your diverse employees. Also speak with networks to better understand what more you can do to ensure that we have success in this field. Talk about diversity and inclusion to your stakeholders. Have those conversations. Get them thinking. Get them involved. Be the voice of your own conscience. Thank you. Some questions. Do we have some questions for us? Here. Yes. We've just met. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the devastating image of filling out a pile of rejection letters that your father kept, and I wonder what that must have done to him to have kept them, why he kept them, and also what that did to you to read them. Well, you know, uh, great question. I mean, I've always pondered why he kept them. Mm -hmm. Was it as a reminder, an aid memoir of just how difficult life was in the 60s and the travails everyone had, even, even my mother. So obviously, you looked at the heights of society. He, he did get a job as an article clerk after tramping around London and finding someone who was an old Indian act who, who knew that actually he had some talent and took him on. And why he kept him in the loft, I have no idea. And um, But it was a real eye-opener. Because like that generation, uh, especially in Indian family, he was a big classic Indian family, he, was, you know, he, he, he wouldn't talk about that sort of thing, his trials and tribulations and hardships he faced. So perhaps that was, that was a legacy for my sister and myself. And um, I, you know, it, it did impact us both, for sure. But, uh, yeah. Yes, is, is there any uh, kind of survey on small businesses and their diversity? Is there data that we can get hold of, maybe through your organisation? Well, you could, because uh, we're, we're, gonna, <laughs> we're about to do that work. Ah. I mean, the, the, the 
because um, yeah, I'm trying to wind on a nice budget to, to get get the research work done, and we we will be doing it. It's an imperative. I mean, we don't have, and we're not the only ones. I mean, the business organisations in this country are, you know, they're 30 years behind, you know, in terms of looking at their own composition and looking at their own diversity, measuring it and looking at, you know, what they can do to engage. And, and, and if, if, if I asked most of the organisations, said, what is, what is the makeup of your membership exactly? Very few would be able to tell me. You know? So, you know, it's a really good question. And I, I find it incredible that many of these organisations have no idea who their members really are. But um, it's something we, it will be addressed, because I'll make sure that happens. When you were talking about every organisation should have um, diversity and equality built into their sort of structure, or whatever, uh, what, what, what do you think that, that will then sort of achieve? Because I've seen in public sector organisations diversity and equality in terms of sort of the wider issues. The government policies have sort of watered down that whole area of work, and this new word, buzzword, diversity and equality can mean everything and literally nothing. But what worries me is that sometimes this sort of stuff, it marginalises people from the communities that I come from. We're then seen as some sort of a problem, special needs, special attention, tokenistic appointments. And I've seen this sort of work do more damage in Britain's race relations. You know, I don't want to see token uh, people appointed to senior organisational structures then they can't deliver and can't achieve gender, race, disability. Uh, and that's what I'm seeing in some of these public sector organisations. OK, you make, you make a really good point. Um, you know, the last thing we want is tokenism. No one wants that. We've seen it before, and it's just rubbish. It doesn't work. I mean, it alienates, you know, a broad press section of people, but we need to be working with us. But what we don't have at the moment, if you look at these big organisations, as in corporates, is at the very highest level. You have to look at your communities and you see the young, talented, brilliant young men and women. Why aren't they out there? We've been here for long enough. You know. So there is an issue and there is a problem. And that can only be solved with engagement. So it's how, how organisations engage with that wider contextual world. And we're talking about everyone with whether it's sexual orientation, disabilities, gender, and saying, well, you know, we need to be more inclusive. How do we get people on board? And that means mentoring right from the beginning, from when people leave school or university, finding the most talented people in every community. We're not talking about um, tokenism. What we're talking about is opening up the potential of this country. That's what we're trying to achieve. And if we do that, we can be so much more than we are at the moment. And that will take hard work because you're, you're talking about ways of thinking and attitudes and inertia and groupthink. I was um, working for a, uh, I was doing some work to organise a, uh, a, a big event in the city for uh, a big, I shouldn't even name it, but a big international um, headhunter, so a bunch of headhunters, and they, they were really in on diversity. So we organised this fantastic event, and they thanked me very much, and then I met the board and I looked at them, and there were ten people there, they were all white, two of them were women. And I said, and I actually said, have you just taken a look at yourself, you're an international company, and you don't even look like your customers and your stakeholders. So, and it was, it was a bit of a shock when they thought about it, and they, and they understood, because they'd actually produced reports on diversity that somehow they needed to look at themselves. And it's, it's, it's really interesting. It's, it's beginning those conversations. It's actually assessing oneself, you know, as I said, uh, and, and, and just beginning that process will be a start because it's, it's something that hasn't been done properly. And we'll make mistakes along the way, but we'll learn how to do it better. But you know when you touched on about the board of uh, 10 white people, yeah? yeah? I've been on the hospital, uh, the University Hospital of Leicester as a patient advisor. And the Care Quality Commission came in a couple of years ago, right? And uh, it was a, a, a black person. She said, I'm really glad to see a diverse group of patient advisors, and I was one of them. And I said to her, just because I come from an, an ethnic minority background and my other colleagues, does it mean that we're actually achieving much in here? How do you know we're not tokenistic appointments? You're, you're quite right. And, I've, I've, and I've we had, were. I've had the same experience myself. 
So, you know, but, th th but that's what we're trying to get over. But when you talk about talented people, there are talented people in our communities, yeah? And there is that institutional discrimination that goes on. I understand that, you know? But that's about power sharing. And until we, and then on whose terms? That's the key when we do diversity or race or whatever, on whose terms? Too often it's white liberal do-gooders. It's their terms. And it does a lot of damage in race relations. Yeah, I sound like quite right wing, don't I? No. But I'm not. You sound the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite working class, you know. Well, uh, yeah, still live in a tennis house. And I live in Belgrade. I see some of the issues that affect our community that I come from. And in race relations, I see a lot of damage sometimes. I've been in Leicester since a three year old. I haven't seen much change. What I've seen, things go down covertly now. When I first came to England, it was racism. My mum got beat up by skinheads in this city, and I saw it at the age of seven. And I'm very angry with the police, and I have always been angry with the police because of what happened to my mum. But the point I'm making is that today, uh, all this diversity and equality stuff is not actually doing us, uh, it's not actually helping us, right? And this right wing government, we're using it completely the other way. Right? And that's why we've got to be very careful. I don't want to see um, people appointed. For to I've seen it in public sector because I'm challenged. I joined the system to challenge institutional racism. I ended up <coughs> challenging my own community. I think oh, I'm, I'm one of those people that deliver services to the public sector. I'm the policy lead for the East Midlands Ambulance Service and soon to be the East of England Ambulance Service. Um, I would agree with you. I think there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and I think the tokenistic process, what it does is patronise people and just reduces the relationships that you then build with people. And I think it's got to be a multi-pronged attack. Um, but one of the things that I face, my colleagues who I work with um, across the, the Leicester, Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland Division, is that we talk about two forms of denial. There's denial when you think you know something and you're completely clueless. And then there's what we call enlightened denial, when you have a little bit of information about something like diversity or inclusion or racism, whatever it's going to be, and you suddenly become the expert on all things racist or racism. And that creates a tremendous block for people moving on and developing services. It's a constant process, you have to keep on going. Um, but my level of frustration as a white gay man um, from a middle class background is that, you know, my voice alone won't achieve very much. You've got to do it as a collective. And it's got to be the right sort of people. When you made your comment about getting people through the door, and whether it be a woman or a man or somebody with a disability, it's got to be the right people. Because if you don't, it becomes tokenistic. And if you put somebody there because they're black or they're gay or whatever, then you're just creating more problems for yourself. And I have to tell you, from an equality perspective, I see a lot of my colleagues from those communities who are incredibly talented, incredibly skilled, have a great deal of experience, starting to lose their sense of who they are and what they're about because they are seen as tokenistic within the role of the equality leader within an organisation. And the damage that causes, not only to the community, but to the organisation, particularly the public sector. We are governed by some clear guidelines. The Workforce Rate Equality Standard, for, for example, is very clear about what we have to achieve. And there's a constant flow of work going into that to ensure we do represent and we do reflect the, the communities that we serve. But that's going to be a two-way street. We've got to get people through the door. And we've got to, have, we've got to start having some very honest discussions. And if we don't have those honest discussions, we'll just be doing this in 20 years' time. we have be my professional view. And I work in Sinatra every day. No, no, I completely agree with you. I think you both have some very excellent points. What you've really helped emphasise and highlight it. We've been favoured for 30 years. Yeah, whatever you've done. And I think that's, that's the most important point that you've really brought forward here, is that we've been failing. So we need to do it differently. Can I add something in a slightly different tact in terms of the issue around challenge? When um, people are brought into a particular organisation, so the African heritage, Asian heritage or whatever, to a particular job, they usually go to, from the point of view, I think, because I've been that role myself, from your job description. Now, something has to be inherent within anybody it takes on an equality and diversity post to think how am I going to challenge because nine out of ten times you challenge you will find yourself marginalized I think you need to address that but at the same time because you're from a generation I am speaking for myself a generation that saw other people marginalized before they even got through the doors of whatever industry they were going for, 
I then thought to myself, the tack has to be, I have to be me, regardless of what my employer expects from me, I have to know that if I'm there to address a particular issue, I don't dull it down, I don't fall back from it. It may have repercussions, but I think people have to be brave right. to deal with that. Absolutely. Because when your bravery could be that you have people around you who support you, whether it's people in your family, people in your wider family, as in your friends, people in the workforce where you are represented and you are representing particular issues and so on. And you're also, I think from the get-go, taking it usually on from the perspective that you know something about what you're talking about. And if you don't know what you're talking about, you shouldn't be there. I think it's just the case that it pays a bill. You can make money more or less anywhere. But I feel people need support when they're in the roles of equality and diversity to challenge. And it doesn't have to be the chief executive of the organisation who may be more racist than any other person along the senior management route. But it could just be generally colleagues. And it's about having integrity. Because without that, you can fall back into nothingness and just feel then and recognise then that you are being used as a token person within a particular remit. Equality and diversity is everybody's business, just like safeguarding. Yes, you see a child walking into the world, you let the child walk. You see a colleague who's being treated disrespectfully, do you let that stand? It's about how you, as a person, with a particular remit, function. If you need to get your bravery, um, what do you call it? Your bravery braces, yeah, <laughs> tightened, you need to sometimes do that outside of the place that you work. Even though the remit that you actually go and standing for is one that you believe in. I believe in equality and diversity, it's all around me. I see it, I feel it, I smell it, I hear it. I've chosen to come and live in Leicester and live in West Hills, but yet work for an authority that's on the border. Yes, it pays the rent, it pays the bills, but it also means I can challenge. You don't always have to feel anxious about where you work and the reader that you have and not feel that you can actually make a difference. Young people now are looking older people more so than ever before to pull them through to give them a, a, a bit of insight into how do they get into the door to do x y and z job at some point those who have already or are now in their particular roles sitting back and saying oh well i get paid at the end of the month it doesn't matter lives are being lost lives are being trodden down i went to a, an event again ran by ambrose last night the screening of the film and it really shows you that yes we've come a long way in the last 50 years but there's a lot of mileage still to go and whether it's in the small and medium enterprise sector whether it's in the public sector people have got to be brave we're now living in a time where i feel people can feel quite marginalized very easily but you have to find some kind of um connection to other people who can help you to get through or get over or get under hurdles because if you don't younger people coming up now through the education system who then would be lost with no way to go so that's my theory on it be brave you know you're going to come across you know um knockbacks but you have to have some kind of measure of bravery in how you deliver with equality and diversity. If you've got a spare pair of those bravery and brace. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how we're going to keep this level of debate up for the rest of the evening. This has started at an incredibly high rate here. There's some seats at the front here if you want to come on. Um, feel a bit more involved. It must be hard to hear. Yes. <laughs> And unless we can tackle all those kind of things, I believe for the risk of that 30 years or so, to be honest. One is, um, an example is, I went to Carlisle City Council for 
15 years. And the only room white person for 15 years, and never came across throughout the county, I worked around the county, ever come across anybody at all. Um, doing a job that was quite a strategic role within the housing department. And <clears throat> I came across, uh, I'll be honest, uh, uh, white Freemason uh, strategic director who had taken over my area of work, you know, my sort of section or whatever, new to the area, and he was determined to undermine me. And it was very obvious, and he literally told me that I am going to be managed by somebody else and my team, and I will be working on a part. This is allowed to, to manifest in the first place. But I had to go all the way to the chief exec and he did all the rest of it and it was stopped. Ultimately, he did leave. However, like the lady says, what ends up being is that there are some individuals who can stand up for this, they can't let go of, of um, bad uh, experiences, are the people that get seen to be the troublemakers in a way. And therefore, there's a catch to it too. Unless you stand up for yourself, you're never going to help anybody else in the future. That's one example. The second example is they never had anybody uh, in, in, I mean, I was, you know, okay, a manager, but low, very, very low level. They um, reported to the government uh, statistics, and I challenged them on that to say that they, they had no non uh, white people at uh, strategic director level and they were their target was that within three years they would get somebody at the top level or, or, or second level and I was saying well when you've got one person and you're getting rid of them how is it that you're going to be able to achieve that you're going to just fly them from London or something you know because there's no one here you know but those statistics count because they get the money for taking all I think that's two, two examples third one even in Leicester <clears throat> Again, those targets I challenged them as well. Um, to say that they had 17% at the second year um, of money market. And I asked who that was. I mean, you know, one person ends up being 17%. It sounds good. Mm -hmm. But when you, you drill down and actually ask the question, uh, it was somebody that had just recently, at that time, uh, uh, it's changed now. Uh, at that time, one person who had recently arrived in Leicester from Europe, and in 50 years of Asians and all these other people living here, nobody's ever managed to get in Leicester. So we're talking about the most diverse city. Here's the facts. And the other point I was going to say is that at a strategic level, when people from the top do want to employ somebody, at a higher level, they are very, very careful when they do bring. They, unfortunately, I'm sure a lot of people will agree. Yes, people are the ones that will get through. So, ultimately, we've either got docile people who are willing to, to go with the flow, or there are activists. And you don't get a true picture of people, of genuine workers, and in you know, proper. Um, Engagement. This is my my this is my real experience. So. Well, thank you, Chairman. So mm -hmm. support. I mean that that was the important really. Fifty years on. Yeah. I mean, you know, what so does that say? Well, I think that's what we do. I think we have a, mm. a huge challenge. I think all these stories just uh, reinforce reinforce that. Mm.